So um, just really briefly, the, I, do, I do things very um, interactively when I'm here um, at Aspen. So I'm opening up this panel to questions as of now, essentially, just after we get through the um, introductions. So if you have a question, uh, and actually I asked the students, our young scholars, at this table to throw out the first question, and I told them that they had to do it within the first seven to 10 minutes. So they're actually in a state of panic over there. Um, <clears throat> but you know, we love you guys, and we believe that intuitively, you will know the exact question that needs to be asked to a panel talking about immigration in the United States of America. But um, very interactive, you know, just raise your hand. We have microphones. Wait till the microphone gets to you. My name is Maria Hinojosa. I was born in Mexico City. I was raised on the south side of Chicago. Something that you may not know about me unless you follow me on Instagram is that I'm a boxer and I'm also a succulentologist. <laughs> that was a joke. I, I have succulents in my windowsills in New York City. It's a big deal for me. Um, and I'm an independent journalist. Um, and right now, my state of mind is challenged. Challenged, a little scared, a little sad, a little um, empowered at the same time. So let's do that for each one of us. Jose, you start. Uh, I'm Jose Antonio Vargas. I'm from the Philippines, but I grew up here. Uh, I run an organization called Define American, defineamerican.com, check it out. Um, honored to be among fierce women. Thank you for having me. Um, and the word in my mind is history. I think when I, at this moment, I, I find a lot of comfort and a lot of peace reading history. I am a Somali refugee who came here uh, after a civil war broke out in my home country. And one thing that folks may not know about me is that I'm very resilient. And I come from a generation that has been resisting for a very long time. Um, and part of a community that has been disenfranchised and marginalized. And even though the threats that we face are challenging, they're not, they're not new. They're, they're just more out in the open and more ferocious, of course. But a quirky thing about me is I can get the entire room to memorize my name in a few seconds. All right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone raise your right hand. I promise I'm not making you swear to anything. I know, but that's kind of cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> so say, this is my hand. This, this is, is my, my hand. hand. Now we're going to just forget about the word this and say, it's my hand. It's my, my hand. hand. And that's my name. It's my hand. It's my hand. <laughs> OK, funny thing. OK, this, I'm not going to test you on this, but my <laughs> son's name, who's 22 and in Rome right now, God bless him, Raul Ariel Jesus de Todos los Santos Perez Hinojosa. And my daughter's name is Maria Jurema Guadalupe de los Indios Perez Hinojosa. I'm not going to test you. <laughs> Gabby. Maria Gabriela Pacheco Santos. Okay. <laughs> AKA names. Gabby. <laughs> uh, I am originally from Ecuador. My family and I migrated to the US um, in 1993 when I was eight years old. And uh, I grew up in sunny sunshine, Florida, Miami, Florida. And um, <clears throat> I have a mix emotions. Um, yesterday I was sharing with, with the young people how tired I am. Um, how much uh, feeling of, of fear and anger and anxiety. Um, but at the same time, um, part of me feels um, really hopeful. Um, part of me feels that um, we are, are at the cusp of something that um, we are, we're hitting rock bottom. Um, <laughs> but that only means that uh, we are on a trend to hopefully uh, move up. Yes. Okay. So um, what I want to do is I want to talk about kind of where we're at, <clears throat> what it's like to be us. Um, every single person on this panel was not born in this country. Were you born in this country? No. So none of us were born in this country. You should know, obviously, that that is now a new litmus test for how people are treated. And I know you're kind of like, wait, what? But essentially, people who are not born in this country um, we have the possibility of having due process denied to us simply for that reason. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we're feeling about this particular moment. But then quickly, I'd like to move into a question that I get asked a lot, which is, so what do we do? Um, and, and what is, you know, who, 
who's responsible for kind of acting in this moment? And as a journalist, I'm responsible for telling these stories, for trying to be the most honest um, journalist that I can be at this moment. But what's the responsibility that we all share? So I, I said to Jose, actually, first thing when I sat down, I said, you know, how dare I say that I feel a little fear fearful? I mean, I was born in Mexico City. I became a citizen in the late 1980s, in part because at that time, Central America was exploding. You may remember that. And, um, and there was a very tense relationship around activists and Central America. And, um, and I said, you know what, I need, to, I need to become a citizen. One day I'm going to be traveling back from Cuba, where I was reporting, or from Nicaragua, or from El Salvador. Though, and I'm going to come and cross that border or the way I have my whole life. And they're going to say, no, nah, you know what, no, 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 you can't come. And that's what I said, I'm going to become a citizen. You know, I have family members who have green cards. I don't have anybody who is undocumented in my family. So how dare I say that I'm, that I'm feeling fearful? I think um, when Gabby, who probably knows more about immigration policy than practically anybody in Congress, so if you have any questions <laughs> about policy, just ask Gabby. <laughs> I told Republicans they were being played. FYI, read the political piece on how they got played just yesterday on immigration. My, my, favorite, <laughs> my favorite piece about Gabby Pacheco was uh, the lead in the Wall Street Journal. 2012, um, the last thing um, the Obama White House wanted was more noise from Maria Gabriela Pacheco. <laughs> so just check that out. I just love that article. Um, so I think what people misunderstand about this moment is that it's not just about undocumented immigration. Like this entire administration and the entire ecosystem, we now have Breitbart running the White House. We have Fox News as a propaganda media machine. And what they're against is migration of any kind, right? And I think what Maria Nosa is one of the few journalists in the country who actually does this, is the media really fails to contextualize the reality that the 11 million undocumented population are a part of the total 43 million immigrant population. Like, you can't separate us apart, right? Like, we were mixed, we're all mixed up. So when you're attacking, you know, US citizen children, you're, you're not, divorcing them from their two undocumented parents, right? So it's, it, it's an all out assault. And the fact that there's not a single reform that's being considered that doesn't, that doesn't include um, minimizing legal migration, isn't that fascinating? They're like, oh, just do it legally. And now they don't even want you to do it legally. They just want to end it. That to me is what I find, um, not unprecedented, because we've been at this moment before, but the reality is 100 years ago, it was British, German immigrants versus Polish, Italian, and Greek. As far as I know, I don't know how it all happened, but you all just became white, right? Now, most of the 43 million immigrant population are not, right? And so this question of assimilation and who gets to be American and all of that, is that's why that is much more, um, to me, much more visible. Like the otherness is much more visible. So and, remember, and Maria, just a oh, small hold on a second. Remember, I'm expecting you guys for any minute now. <laughs> yeah, and and really quick anecdote why it's okay, you know, to be afraid, and you should be afraid. Two women in Montana just recently, oh, yes. two U.S. citizen women in Montana were by the way, stopped. The story was broken by and by Latino rebels, which we own. Hello. Yes, <laughs> um, were stopped by Border Patrol agents at a gas station store and asked if they were citizens because they were speaking Spanish to each other. D who yeah. didn't see that? Did you guys if see you that? Did, if you didn't see it, raise your hand. It's all over. Okay, so that's, no, but this is very interesting mm -hmm. because our social media feeds, yeah. instant. It took off. Again, we're very proud because my small nonprofit owns Latino Rebels, which basically print, uh, put that out there. And so for us, it's a very big deal. But whoa, the majority of this audience had no idea. I have to tell you, though, I am so. But wait, hold on. Oh. Just so you guys know, it's like kind of crazy, right? They're speaking Spanish in Montana. 
you know, como Gabriel, o sea, tú y yo hablamos oh, un poco oh, en español. Sí. O sea, imagínate que estamos comprando algo y nos para la policía. You're making me so uncomfortable, stop. <laughs> ICE agent felt uncomfortable and stopped us and was like, hey. Where are your papers? And he can. Yeah. And he can. One thing I want to add um, in response to this is when we think about immigrants, and I think uh, Jose said it beautifully, I always like to recognize voices that are not in the room. Yep. And one of the things that we tend to forget in this conversation is that aside from our First Nation brothers and sisters who own this land, America was built on the backs of stolen land. And we need to recognize that because that changes our worldview when it comes to our approach to immigration and how we other people who look different than us. So from, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room knows that song that we used to sing um, back in grade school. From California to the New York Islands, yeah. from the Gulf Stream waters, or from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was not made for you and I. And as soon as we start taking this land was our land, this land was made for individuals that look like us, then automatically, what do we get years later? And we get an immigration policy that is in shambles, immigration laws that, again, other people who look different, who might not share the same faith as individuals um, that are in power. So, 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 so I'm wondering, okay, great. And I would just say, I'm asking you to think about if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, It's okay. With, <clears throat> with some of the terms that are being used here. Um, stolen land. Just like, okay, wait, what? We're on land that was essentially the first illegal aliens arrived here. Who, we don't really want to think about the pilgrims as illegal aliens, but if you want to kind of throw that term around. Um, and what Gabi said, which is that there is a direct assault Are you uncomfortable with the term that the people on this panel who are your fellow Americans feel like we are being assaulted simply because of, <clears throat> of who we are? I'm wondering how you're feeling about that, but yes. Questions. First question. Uh, I was wondering. Uh, Can you, you said, just tell me your oh, name, name, like where you're from, like where'd you uh, grow up? Or? My name is Sandra and I'm from Conrad High School. And that's where? In Dallas, Texas. Okay. Okay, I was wondering what you said about the video. Uh, how does that make you feel and react about how when we, like personally, we, some of us talk Spanish in front of other people, they feel uncomfortable, which makes us feel uncomfortable too because they give us like an ugly stare, like they make us feel like we're not supposed to be there. So how does that make you feel and react or trying to make a change of it? I was wondering uh, what do you want to do about it and how will you change it? You know what? I, I, it depends on the moment, um, and that's why I box, so that I'm not necessarily <laughs> boxing in that moment. But you know, if you're seeing somebody and they're looking at you like, then just turn to them and say, how you doing? Doing good, how are you? What's up? How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> you're doing good, have a, have a great day, sir. Have a beautiful day. <laughs> Oye, me, entonces como te estaba diciendo, blah, 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 blah. I mean, of course, I'm, this is my moment right now where I'm just like, but I also understand where you're just like, what's going on here? But the truth is, is this is also uncomfortable. We have to be careful. So I was in Alabama in 2011, uh, the same time that Alabama passed a law saying that if Maria Hinojosa, who's a US citizen, was driving me, you could actually prosecute Maria Hinojosa for driving someone who's undocumented, right? So I'll never forget, I was, a, you know, whenever I go to like a place that I don't know, I go to Walmart, because like I wanna know if they have ethnic aisles, right? <laughs> like if there's like an Asian food aisle and like a Latino food aisle, and then I feel better, <laughs> right? Okay, there's ethnic people shopping here, great. So I was at a Walmart and um, I overheard, I was in an aisle and I overheard this white woman, elderly white woman, say, why can't they just speak English? And on the other aisle, where it was a mother and daughter, I don't know where they're from, Latin women speaking Spanish, um, the elderly white woman, her name is Connie, and I'm a journalist, like Maria, so I'm just talking to Connie. And Connie's 74, at the time when I met her, she was in a home, she was, she was just moved into a home by her kids. And usually, when you hear a story about that, they, you only hear kind of the top two things, which is that this elderly white woman said, these people should stop speaking Spanish, or you know, why are they speaking Spanish? 
It's hard now to get a little deeper into that conversation. So 20 minutes into that conversation, Connie says, what if I can't learn Spanish? Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing this up because I think it's really important that we understand like what the motive, what, what is motivating so much of this, right? A lot of it is fear. Like when, when Connie said, what if I can't learn Spanish? Which is, I don't know if, you've, if we've talked about this concept, but acknowledging that, that for certain white folk, there is a feeling of like, I feel like I'm an immigrant in my own country because I don't understand the country. There's trans people, there's people speaking Spanish, there's like, you know, protest, and there's like, you know, gay marriage. What ha I, I don't understand my country. Well, but, but, but again, but for me though, trying to understand it from this perspective, you know, I remember telling Connie, I don't think they're gonna require you to speak Spanish anytime soon, <laughs> right? I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon, Connie. And then she goes, at some point she said to me, when I told her I was an immigrant, and then I explained that was undocumented, a term she'd never heard because she watches Fox News all day, right? Why? Because it, at, at the home where she was living, if you want to watch Sunday, Sunday football, Fox News and Fox Football Sunday are married to each other. That was the key for me. Because I thought people chose to watch Fox News. When the reality is, a lot of people watch Fox News because it what's, comes with a cable package, right? And sports is like a religion. It's like the only thing that matters and like out in Birmingham is like football, right? So that was interesting to me. But again, I think it's really important at a time like this to understand what's motivating people. And I think we have to understand that this is really hard for everybody. I actually think that's one thing that we don't do enough is to acknowledge how hard this transition is. Again, I'm kind of a history buff. This country added 42 million immigrants between 1776 and 1963. Bear with me. 42 million immigrants between 1776 and 1963. Between 1965 and 2015, you added 43 million immigrants. So check that out. You added 42 million immigrants in 187 years and 43 million immigrants in less than 50 years. And the country's doing okay though. The country's doing okay, yes. Right? Not okay, the country's doing great in terms of you know, kind of the machinery of the country. So that, that flies in the face of, well, they're destroying our country. Yes, but. I would like to push back on that. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, so please questions. Do. If you have questions, remember, okay, we go, all right. <gasps> we have another question from the table. Let's get Can the you push back first? Let's, Let's get the question. Get the question. Then... <laughs> Let's get your question and then there is somebody right in front of you. Um, and then we'll do boom, boom questions and we'll talk. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Romain from Dallas, Emma J. Conrad. And it's more of a comment rather than a question that I noticed whenever y'all were reenacting the Montana event. Oh. And what I noticed after you had said, like, you know, can you please stop? Nearly everyone in the room was laughing at it. And it just shows how, like, how everyone's mindset is at the moment of that, you know, serious mm -hmm. event whenever y'all was just explaining, you know, what happened and how, like, serious and sad it is. And the fact that, like, majority of everyone in this room was laughing, it was just like, you know, kind of in a sense sad, and that's just how I felt about it. Sorry right. if I'm okay. making anyone uncomfortable. It was I, just, I, I, I'm gonna push back. If I didn't have laughter, it would be over. If I didn't laugh about this thing, like last night, you know what I did last night before I went to bed? I watched some Richard Pryor on YouTube. That's what I did before I went to bed. Because if I didn't know how to laugh about how uncomfortable I am, about how I have to get up every day and talk about immigration to everybody, and I can't just be a human being and like, I don't know, talk about like my sick grandmother and instead I have to be here and talk about immigration yet again for the third day, second day, third day tomorrow. Like, right? It's like, I have to laugh about it. If I can't laugh about it, it'd be over for yeah, me. Yeah, but I feel like- I'm I, I get what you're saying. You, you, what's your name? Romaine. So I kind of feel like what Romaine is saying is that we can laugh about it. No. Y'all cannot. <laughs> I think that's a little bit of like, if we're up here like, yeah, man, oh man, and then I had to pull out my citizenship, and man, they were like questioning me because I was speaking Spanish. Yeah. You know, as a journalist, I have to laugh about horrible things because that's why in, in the, on In the Thick, our fabulous politics podcast, please subscribe. Ask someone you know to help you to learn how to subscribe to a podcast if you don't know how. <laughs> and um, subscribe to In the Thick. And we laugh a lot because we're talking about really difficult things, but we do it with humor. Okay, so um, we had a question up here, right here in the front, and then, um, and then we're gonna take a question all the way in the back again in that corner. So just be real brief with your question. Sure. 
uh, try to be brief. Most people are, I think, empathetic to the issue of immigration. But why is it that folks who are immigrants uh -huh. don't want other immigrants to come into this country? Okay, good. Shut the door behind you. I, I've encountered many. And then all the way in the back from the, from the young scholars, again. Thank you for your question. Get, go ahead. Yep. I'm kind of a young scholar. I'm their teacher. <laughs> okay. Conrad. You are young, yes. You are young. Yes, you are, ma'am. <laughs> so what I was wondering is, when you were talking with Romaine and speaking back and forth, you said that you guys get to laugh, but they don't. When does the sense of other need to stop? Yeah. Because, I mean, I'm totally for immigration, but at the same time, it comes a point to when you're an immigrant or a black person or any minority, when can you start accepting the people who want to accept you? And where do you draw oh, that line? A great question. Th that's, that's why I'm saying it's all very flowing, right? It's all very free-flowing. And as, in my view, as long as we're creating a safe space where we can look at each other and be just like, well, what you just said, like, nah, I don't think so. That's, I hope, what is the beauty of democracy, in my view. Do you guys want to jump in? So as someone who is visibly Muslim, who always gets those stares, and I want to direct the question, um, the answer to you before I get to the other two questions, is own it. Because I treat, every time I get those stares or you know, people are just like, what in the world is she wearing? How dare, I've gotten questions where, you know, how dare you wear this? Are you hiding a bomb underneath your oh veil? My God. Oh my God, um, how many times have you been asked that? I, I, I lost count, I lost count. And, and the reality is for someone who's not just visibly Muslim, but I'm also visibly black as well. Yep. And also there's a, there's a different type of discrimination that comes with that. So it's like I get the Islamophobia, I get the discrimination, the racism, and also as a woman as well, right? So for someone who's visibly black, who's visibly Muslim, who's visibly uh, and identifies as a woman, I treat the world like it's my runway. And in like terms it's your of, runway. Like it's my runway. runway, yeah. And so you mean when like you're walking, like you're strutting? I will strut and say, okay. you know what, I own every single bit of my identity because it, it, it's, it makes who I am, and it's the light that I have that I can share, you know, different cultures with individuals, different food, because again, dialogue is important, right? So why in the world would I be ashamed because someone is afraid of what it is that I represent? So you engage? I engage with individuals. And just understanding, you know, when, especially when it comes to the concept of immigration, refugees are often missing from that conversation. Yep. Absolutely. And oftentimes, you know, when we look at the immigration system, we tend to forget there's different ways of becoming an immigrant here in, in, in the United States. And I hope this kind of answers your question. Whether it's the family uh, reunification process or employment-based immigration, and then you have that cri uh, criteria of being a refugee or an asylum seeker, individual who is given a status of being a refugee while they're in another country and then they're invited here, or you come through a port of entry and seek asylum. And then, of course, there's humanitarian relief criteria such as TPS, temporary protected status. And the reality is there's different ways of becoming immigrants here. And the statement that I always say is not all immigrants are refugees, mm -hmm. but all refugees are immigrants. Yeah. You don't become a refugee by choice. You don't become a refugee by choice. No one chooses to leave their home with nothing but the clothes on their back. No one chooses to leave that which they are familiar with to become part of a new country or a new system and understanding or learning new languages. The idea is the fear of what it is that you're escaping and the fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. The unknown is more hopeful. So Would then you, you have the audacity to dream that you can have a better life for yourself and your family and you come to the shores of America. And for us to be closing those golden doors, those hopes that people have to live, is audacious. Which is why I said yesterday in the panel that Jose and I did, um, that if you can imagine, if you've ever seen or heard Hamilton, the play, that if you can think of the people that are at the border right now, or who are being yeah. held in detention camps across our country, that what they're embodying is that song, my shot, right? This is my shot to survive. Right. It's my shot to survive. If we imagine them like that, like this is my shot to survive as opposed to a horde of, you know, flooding, infesting, invaders, infiltrators, MS-13, but actually people who are like, this is my shot. But, but this is where the language really matters. Like, 
2014, during the crisis, in some, you know, during the Obama years, those kids were not being called refugees, right? Like, I think even the and, language and, and that famous, we use. And who famously said something about those kids? Which politician? Oh, I mean. Hillary. Oh, I mean, <laughs> the president, President Obama, Hillary Clinton. What did Hillary Clinton say? Send them back. I mean, I was, I was, I remember seeing that, and I, I used to cover Hillary Clinton when I was a political reporter. And, you know, Hillary Clinton, like, um, a champion of children's rights since she was and in Arkansas and, and women's rights. And sh this issue is so politically toxic that this champion of children's rights couldn't say that those kids deserved a home here. She said, she said, send them back. More than once. More than once, yes, Maria. And but, but what was incredible, though, about that moment again, and th this idea again of who gets to be a refugee, who gets to be an immigrant, who gets to be... Um, the language that we use around this issue to me has been a real border into a better understanding what the issue is about. So, sir, you talk about the, you said legal immigrants. No, yeah, other immigrants who are like, you know, close the door, shut the door. You mean, you mean, you mean other people of color legal immigrants or who say, who say that? Exactly. Yes. You know, I actually think I've traveled all across the country. Um, I would, in my experience, a lot of those, a lot of people you're talking about are actually in the minority and they just, their voices are just amplified a lot more, that they're the ones who say, why can't they do it the right way? They're the ones who say that, without them acknowledging the fact that there is no right way. Or them saying, oh, you know, I paid $200,000 and waited in the line 10 years, assuming that people like me wouldn't want to wait, you know, 20, 25 years to become a US citizen. And I don't, I don't even want to tell you how much money I've, paid, I've spent trying to figure out my own immigration process, right? So immigration is not one size fits all. This is what makes this issue so complicated, right? This is not like you're pro-gun control against gun control. This is like so complex. And I think one important thing um, that we have to unpack with why we're telling you that Hillary Clinton said in 2014 when we were having the very similar crisis that we're having today yep. with families and children fleeing and coming to our nation asking for help, right, is that this is not just a Trump issue. Yeah. And we continue to say Trump, 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 and Stephen Miller and the Dep Department of Homeland Security Secretary and Sarah Huckabee, whatever, whatever, right? Yes, they're part of the problem. But this is a bigger problem, yep. and we are all part of it. So it's up to every single one of us to try to do something. And why this question of the whole back and forth, can we laugh, can we not laugh, like who can't? It's about, we need you, point blank, yep. right? I, um, uh, two nights ago, we were around a table and I was asking the folks in the table, whose job is it? I have done so much. I, one of my favorite things to do, and, and it's kind of like a masochist thing to do, is <laughs> I go to Tea Party rallies, I go to anti-immigrant rallies, I go to places where it's dangerous for me to be there. But I go there because I want to engage, because I want to talk to people, because I want people to see that, yes, I may have an A number, right, which A stands for alien, by yep. the way, that I am an immigrant, that I am a woman and Latina, that I might not be white, but I'm not there to replace you. I'm not there to hurt you. I'm not, I'm not here to cause you harm. I just wanna be part of this nation. I wanna belong and I wanna uh, just a space. I wanna earn that space, right? And so I kept on asking like, whose job is it? Is it our job to go across everywhere? Like trying to say like, hear us out, let us be, right? So I think it's really important to not just pinpoint this on Republicans, yep. on Trump, right? Yep. It's, yes, they're doing really bad, terrible things. But Democrats are doing bad and terrible things, right? And then it is up to every single one of us to do something. So that's one of the reasons why if you listen to the media that we produce out of my small nonprofit, um, you'll never hear us use the term illegal to refer to a human being. You'll also never use, we don't use the term minority, but I'm asking you to think one for a moment, how often you have used the term illegal in your own language and vocabulary. Oh, I was talking about these illegal immigrants over here. Uh, there was a group of illegals on the, did you hear about that illegal who was deported? 
The New York Times still uses the term. And the Washington Post. The Washington Post, even NPR recently. Yep. Um, and I say that to you with love because I didn't learn that from a radical Latino studies professor. <laughs> I learned it from Elie Wiesel. And he was the one who said to me, there is no such thing as an illegal human being. You may have committed an illegal act. You are not illegal. So one thing you can do is to never use the term illegal to refer to a human being. And when you hear people using that term, to stop and have a, a dialogue. We've got a bunch of questions. So what I want to do is I'm going to get one question. Is there another mic over here? OK, can you just can you raise your hands? We have these two questions over here. So I want to hear one question, two, three, and we'll bring it back so to the panel. I commend the panel. Um, I must tell you, I'm not laughing. I'm totally embarrassed. And I was when I walked in the room. And I am. I visited a major client of ours in the southeast. Um, he's Indian. He's been here for years. He has a PhD. And the first thing he said when I walked in the door, he said, for the first time in my life, I am uncomfortable being in America. Bad con I couldn't deal with that. So my question for you all is, to what extent is this generational? <laughs> Are young people in their 20s and 30s, they're born in America, that you know, are Caucasians, for want of a better description. Are they more tolerant? Are they more willing to accept? Because they have grown up in a different environment, in schools, in colleges. I guess I'm asking a question, hoping I get the answer that I'd like. Um, but I'm embarrassed. There's nothing funny about this. Thank, thank you so much for sharing how you're feeling. I really appreciate that. Two questions right here. Quick, quickly, probably for Gabby. Uh, address the Cuban immigrant as opposed to the rest of the immigrants. Okay, great, thank you. Great question. Your question here. Uh, this is very um, beautiful conversation, thank you. I'm Melinda Delmonico from Golden, Colorado. And my, my father immigrated from Hungary um, a little bit before he was arrested by the communists. And so I, you know, I, I know um, when you're a political refugee what that feels like from hearing his stories. And I guess my question is the complexity of the issue, because you're talking about human beings and compassion. Um, we're also talking about policy. My husband and I just got back from listening to Chuck Schumer talk about the eight senators who came up with a bill that actually seemed pretty reasonable. What is the policy? From your perspective, what do we need to do? And I also want to make one other comment. You know, America is a big experiment. We look at the rest of the world. I go to Europe, Hungarians, they're white people in Hungary. Um, they blocked out immigrants on their, just recently over the past couple of years, as you know. So are there any other countries that are doing the same experiment as us? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you guys want one more question, or should we do those? Three? I think there's, there's, there's a lot in those. Okay. I mean, can we get, if you I, have I a question address, over here, raise your hand, and we'll try to get the mic to you. I really want to address that question, sir, that you asked, because that was actually one of my concerns when I started doing this work. The generational question. The generational question. So I, we did a film with MTV called White People. It's up on YouTube. You can check it out. And MTV did a study with Define American of 1,000 millennials. Because I assumed what you're assuming. I made the wrong assumption, right? And what was interesting to me about that was that you now have a generation of mostly white people, right, who grew up with parents and all the talks about affirmative action, who gets college scholarships. I was totally shocked, for example, that it didn't matter where the white, where the white students were progressive or conservative. They believe that people like us get more college scholarships than white students. Completely a lie. Right? It's not true that people of color get more college scholarships than white students. Yet, most white people, young white people, believe that. And then the study showed that half of the millennials, white millennials, believe that racial dis discrimination against white people is as big a problem as racial discrimination against people of color. And then here's the interesting thing. 90% of white people live in predominantly, I mean 90% of white people mostly have white friends and 75% of white people live in predominantly white towns, meaning the only time they encounter us is the news media they consume and the television shows and the movies that they watched. And the fact that they often don't look to see who's cooking their food so or delivering the, their that food. That kind of segregation is really happening in all corners, and that's why, you know, that young teacher who didn't look like a teacher because she looked so young. This question of who gets to welcome who, right? And like what grace we give each other is so important. Um, and I would argue it gets lost in so much of the political posturing that happens. But 
Gabby, jump in on the Cuban. The Cuban question. The Cuban. This goes back to your question, right? And when you were saying like immigrants, and I immediately, uh, immediately thought Marco Rubio, <laughs> Carlos Corbello, right? All these um, Republican uh, Cuban uh, senators and, and Republican well-off uh, people that came to the United States. And there was a law that says uh, wet foot, dry foot, if you had one foot in the US and the other and whatever, right? You can get, after a year and a day, green cards. And um, it, it's upsetting how many Cubans say, we did it the right way. And I'm like, oh, but like hundreds and thousands and all these people that come through our border are doing the same exact thing. Why not them and why you, right? And so I, I think with that, uh, there's just a lot more to the couple that we can do right here. But um, I think at the end of the, the, the day, it is the same fear that those people have that people who are afraid of people like us in middle America are having. And it's the fear of there's not enough resources, they're taking away from us, they're taking our jobs, they're on welfare, la 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 la, right? It's the same concept that because I am here, they are gonna be not well or that um, they're gonna suffer, right? That there's not enough space. Yep. There's two points that I wanted to make mm -hmm. before we move on to a question. Is the concept of uh, inclusivity yep. and also the importance of language. And I think Gabby and Jose kind of alluded to this as well, is when we look at the words that we're using, even something, have, how many of us have seen in the media about the family separations that are going on, where children are being taken away from their parents? And it's devastating, it's cruel, and it's an inhumane, zero, to uh, zero tolerance policy. But the language that we use to even describe that situation, we're telling families that they're being put in detention centers. We're making it seem, it's, 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 it makes sense in our minds, detention centers, until your case is cleared. But these are incarceration camps. They're jails. They're jails. I've been inside detention centers. I've They're concentration arrested. camps. They're, concentration They're not death camps. camps. Different. Absolutely. Not death camps. They are concentration camps. One thing you can do is to go and find them in your community. They are there. Yep. Right. You'll have to drive into the middle of nowhere, and you'll see a huge cement building with barbed wire everywhere. You probably won't see any human beings outside. And inside there, tens right. of people are being held. Well, and and so used by to the it. way, right. companies are making huge profits off of that. Yep. Check like your, your shares Check your and shares. Vanguard and stuff. Making I a bet profit. that your shares are, are coming from Making that. a profit off of yeah. keeping a body in a cell. The highest profits right now that are being drawn by private prison companies are not coming from incarceration, but through immigration detention. Um, I just wanted to say, um, just wouldn't it be great if a city said, oh, we'll take all of those immigrants all of the people who are at the border, the women, the children, we'll take them. We've got an ab abandoned city that needs to be, and just take a, a little bit of the money that we're spending on, on detaining them to give them like, you know, here's $3,000, <laughs> like do something. Will those houses get fixed up? Will those communities take off? In, in part, what I like to think of in the economic argument is, you know, Joe the plumber, with African-American Joe the plumber and Mexican <laughs> dude in the middle, and they're all hugging Mexican dude and saying, legalize him because if you do, our personal economy goes up. Our personal economy is tied to the fact that their economies will be booming because that's what immigrants do. We get the job done. Yeah. And, and to the, the policy, policy question. You something else to yeah. Add. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly, Miami for the Cubans. Yeah. Very pretty. Oh my God, we've got so many questions so, now. But, so really quickly, because I, yeah, the policy, right? <laughs> so for, so I think it's really important, and I don't know if you got to hear yesterday, um, uh, John, uh, uh, Carrie, Carrie, talk about the root causes of migration, oh, gosh, right? Yes. <laughs> We're not talking about that. We're talking about what do we do? Do we jail them apart? Do we jail the families together? It's like what? Right. right? Why are we talking about why is it that these families are leaving and why are we not taking responsibility for the fact that in the 80s, as Maria was talking about, right, the U.S. was directly responsible for what is happening today in those countries. How many of you know that? When Gabby said, raise your hand high if you're like, yeah, I completely under, you need to raise your hands high, you guys. So the majority of the room does not instinctly know what happened with Central America and the fact that the reason why they're here is because of the fact that we were there. We were there. 
to put something into context um, for the prison uh, industrial complex, I brought out this fact sheet because these are numbers that people do not know about as yeah. much. When it comes to the Corrections Corporation of America, CCA, their, a CCA, their annual revenue is $1.7 billion. And the other major uh, private prison, um, the GEO Group, annual revenue is $1.2 billion. They're profiting off of trafficking humans. Maria, I just, I just have to really add. I, 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 actually, this is, I came up with this phrase because I, I get asked this a lot, is this idea that we are not just coming here because of the American dream or the Statue of Liberty or because my mom thought that being in America was a better life. All of those things are true, right? But for the most part, a lot of us are coming here because you are in our countries, right? We are here because you were there, right? And actually, if you look at the global migration crisis, right, there's 253 million people in the world today who are migrants. We don't know how many of them are undocumented. The refugees, I think they're saying about, about 30 million or so, 35 million. But again, the language there, I don't know how to. But the great majority of those 253 million people are migrating to countries that previously colonized or imperialized them. That is an issue that we are not talking about. I have to say from a policy perspective, because I used to think there was a policy answer. I don't anymore. I don't anymore because we can't talk about policy if we're not on the same page about what this even is about, mm, yeah. right? The fact that we are paying, we as an undocumented worker, undocumented entrepreneur who creates jobs for this country, I paid for my own detention in a cell for eight hours when I was detained four years ago. Right? We are directly paying into a system that detains and deports us. I don't know how many people here know that undocumented workers pay $100 billion into Social Security in the past decade. According to the Social Security Administration, if without us, Social Security wouldn't be solvent. Right? And yet most Americans don't know that because they don't listen to NPR's Latino USA and the Futuro Projects. Because most, you know, I can't, as a journalist, I can't even get the Washington Post to not play into the anti-immigrant rhetoric and all of the bad information that's being spread by this anti-immigrant machine. And as journalists also, we are being blocked. We are being blocked, yes. We have five minutes left, you guys. <laughs> we have five Look at this. Left. This is insanity. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I feel like I can't um, So here's see. the reality, here's the reality. Um, we actually don't have to leave this room immediately. Oh. Like, we're not replacing, They're, no one's gonna replace us, haha. -ha. Um, <laughs> so we don't have to leave this room, which means we can stick around a little bit more. You guys got, I know I have yeah. a meeting in a little bit. Yeah, So we let's answer just, questions. We'll, we'll just do this. If you have to leave, we understand. I actually am gonna, if we can, let's do a lightning round of just question, 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 so that we can get the audience to at least express themselves. Yes, just be brief so we can get a lot. No worries. My name is Carrie Burchell. I'm from Dallas, Texas, and these are also my students. Uh, during the course of this dialogue, I've heard a lot of our country feeling uncomfortable, um, th that type of language. And so my question is, in a country that is built off of stolen land mm -hmm. and stolen people, yep. how do we decide whose country this is and who gets the luxury and privilege of feeling uncomfortable here? Yep. Beautiful. Yep. Thank you very much. Yes, another question right there. Jump up, jump up. Come on, meet the mic, meet the mic. Meet you gotta collaborate mic. here. You haven't talked about the cost of immigration, so we understand that $100 billion might have been paid into Social Security, but if you go down Valley here to Carbondale or to other, some of the communities down here where there has been quite a bit of migration from Latin America, it's put a real strain on schools and uh, yeah. The kids that were born in this country, a lot of the parents feel that they're being held back because half the kids in the school can't speak English. Okay, thank you. Do we have a microphone over here? Let's get your question. Hi, my name is Gunnar Sachs. I'm from Switzerland. Um, and I've spent 25 years here in the US. One thing that I've seen that I find really concerning, and I'd love to hear from the panel, and you've alluded to it a few times, is the shift in language that has occurred in the last 18 months. Yep. Um, and what people feel comfortable saying. Um, you know, it, we in Europe found America with its political correctness a little over the top. Um, 
but the amount you've gone backwards from that perspective is, you know, you've gone back to, to yeah, a hundred years, yeah. yeah. Okay, and one last question right here, this gentleman right here. Uh, my name's Alex Sanchez, so I live here, and I was wondering if you guys could talk about the hypocrisy that America has with undocumented workers. Um, that Aspen really couldn't be built without undocumented <laughs> workers. Yes. Um, but ICE rates come far and few in between uh, compared to the rest of the country. Correct. Um, also, if you go into the fruit industry within California, um, so, you know, there's immigration at the border, but when you go into these areas where undocumented workers really build these areas and maintain them, you don't see as much immigration talk around those parts. Um, so I was wondering if you could touch on that as well. Thank you. And I just, okay, so we've got five questions. Just in response to that, so my room, which is on the campus, is right overlooking where all the workers start. Do you know what time they were there this morning? At f no? Five. Are you seeing them? Are you seeing them as they are serving, walking? Are you saying, good morning, buenos dias? Are you having a conversation with them? I spoke to the woman who is not cleaning my room because I told her, if you're paid by the hour, you don't have to clean my room. You have a free room. You don't have to clean it. Um, how are you doing? Where are you from? From El Salvador. What's your situation? Well, you know, I want to get, I have my green card. I want to apply for citizenship. Have you ever had an encounter with the police? Well, they called it an arrest and then saying, you need to speak to it. So this is happening right here, 30 steps from here. They're not living in fear in Aspen yet, because I asked that. But ICE is here. Yep. And soon, this woman with a legal green card who has one arrest, they will come for her. Um, so I appreciate that. OK, so we have you guys. Um, who, did, who gets to decide? who we are, the cost of immigration, the strain, um, the shift in language, and hypocrisy. I'll take that one. <laughs> I, um, this is why in, in the work that we do, we have been so intentionally making sure that we don't talk about immigration without including undocumented black immigrants and native indigenous people. We've been very intentional about that. Um, right now, we actually have 60 defined American college chapters and some in high schools. And what I love is that these students of all backgrounds having this conversation of who gets to belong. As far as I know, like that to me is a part of what, what the response should be at a moment like this. Right? And that we, we are being given a chance to finally face the full force of our history and not ignore any part of it. Right? A country founded on stolen land built by stolen people. Like we just got to understand what that means before we can move any forward, in my opinion. And, and by the way, you do know that the first people who arrived here were not the pilgrims yeah. in Jamestown, okay? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, Southern Florida and then Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah. Just say it. So um, a long time ago, um, I used to tell as a joke um, when people would tell me, well, you're not putting into the country, you're taking, right, yeah. as an undocumented. And I said, look, when I go to the store, I, even if I'm buying a stick, stick of gum or a pair of shoes, I cannot tell that person, hey, don't charge me for those taxes. I'm undocumented. I don't pay taxes, right? <laughs> so this idea, right, that you have people that are coming in and are straining our schools because their children are going there and they're, they're not putting in is a fallacy, is a lie, right? We are putting in as much as we are taking, right? We are as any citizen that has papers as anyone here. And just recently I was reading, and we talked a little bit about this, um, in New York, the school district, there was a school mm -hmm. that it's predominantly Asian students, and it's a school for talented people. They have to take a special test to be able to get into the school, and they wanted to make sure that they desegregated that school and allowed for other people who live in the community to go to the school. Yep. And these Asian parents were really upset, and they were saying, no, you're going to taint it. Our, our children are going to suffer. The level of education is going to go down because of these other children, right? We've heard this before. We heard it not too long ago. We're talking about 40, 50 years ago when this conversation was happening around segregation. And so I think, you know, for me, when I came to this country, I actually was put in a, uh, I, I, yes, I didn't know English. I was learning English. But I was put in a gifted program because I was far ahead in mathematics than anyone else in my class. 
right? So people can learn English, right? Adults, not so much, right? It's a, a lot harder. It's and a lot harder. We can yeah. talk, you know, science about this and the drawer that closes at the age of 13. I studied a little bit about this, right? But children will learn and children will catch up and we will be okay, right? This, the fear that people have about what's gonna happen to our neighborhoods. Things are gonna change. Let me tell you something. Yes, things will change. But I'm sure you love your avocado toast. <laughs> I really love it. It's really good here. Have you had it? No, it's it's so amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing. Um, I, I, let me just say one quick thing in response to the gentleman. Um, so in Georgia, or was it North Carolina, the same, the same question of like, oh my God, what's going to happen? And then they were, you know, and, and parents were, this was a decade ago or more, parents started taking their kids out of the school because yeah, they, they were, did. suddenly had, they had a dual language program. How come they're not spending that money on teaching our kids? And all, mostly the white parents, you know, just pulled out and they were like, the school's going to tank. And actually in the last 15 years, what's ended up happening is that the white parents now are rushing to get their kids into those dual language programs so that they can end up speaking English and Spanish. So what you perceive as a problem is actually, as Gabby is saying, is a total opportunity. Yeah. Your kid, kids, grand, grand, okay, whatever. That, that, thank you, that right there, um, the possibility of people in your family or young people in your family being exposed to another language as opposed to saying, we don't want to learn it, saying, all right, look, we've got these native speakers. Let's have our kids learn this before they turn 13. And oh my God, their economic prospects are just doubling because now they speak a double language. My son speaks four languages. His economic opportunities are extraordinary. So as a po and I understand your fear, by the way, I, I get it. I'm not gonna not acknowledge it. But if we just approach it from, well, let me see what I can do and work with this, so other things can happen because the truth is, is that they are not going anywhere. Um, okay, do we wanna? I, yes, I mean, whatever you think, Maria. <laughs> um, a comment before we kind of Let's get up some here. microphones up here, yeah. and, these, and then go ahead. So it's okay to be uncomfortable. Change cannot happen without agitation. And honestly, when I think about you know, our um, black brothers and sisters and our brown brothers and sisters and even just Muslims and you know, um, South Asians who deal a lot with discrimination, and I mean, there's so many different groups that can go on forever, the fear of losing life, yeah. the fear of losing what you know or a family member is greater than the fear of not knowing what's gonna happen with immigration. Right, so oftentimes people are, well, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen if you know our city becomes more diverse. So I don't. Sometimes I feel like the onus is not on individuals of color, people of color, communities yep. of color, to abate the fear of others. There needs to be a conversation. There needs to be a dialogue, and this is why language is so important and conversations are so important because we're not gonna be able to understand where folks are coming from, right? Unless we get ourselves out of those, out of our comfort zones and have these tough conversations. So you're saying white folks need to be talking amongst themselves about these issues and how to engage? I would, yes, I feel like we need to start off with our own families, we need to start with our own communities, because we're doing the work, and it gets tiring sometimes, because it's not about, just about our freedom, it's not just about what it is that's right for us, it's, we're trailblazing for individuals to have you know, dignity, for individuals to live, to feel like they, they belong. And this is why the concept of inclusivity is important. Because when it comes to the uh, uh, conversation about immigration, I don't, look about, I don't talk about integration, I don't talk about assimilation. What I focus on is inclusivity, yep. right? Because it's natural. If all of us were sitting in a circle right now, and as someone wanted to join that circle, it will be natural for all of us to shift and make room. Mm. We're not gonna force someone to just find room and just be part of the circle. We're all gonna naturally shift. And we need to start having that conversation. And by the way, that means the economy grows. I'm just saying, I, I think the economy grows. Okay. Hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I work a lot with people who are in detention or have left detention. I think something that we need to really take into consideration is that yes, these are concentration camps, but we're one step away from these being death camps for sure. Um, definitely people have died in detention before. Yep. They've died in detention for yes. quite some time, right? And we're seeing this and we also have to acknowledge that these are for-profit industries um, that are not providing, they're, 
um, you know, the, the adequate health care that is needed, yeah. the adequate um, meals that are needed. It's not uncommon to hear from folks saying that they are getting food that's moldy, that is getting food, that they're getting food that's expired. That With they, maggots. Exactly. You know, and Live I think maggots that, in the food that they're being served. Confirmed. Correct. That is yeah. Journalist. So I think it's really important that we all acknowledge that, like, we're definitely one step away, especially in the climate that we are. That this, these are death oh, camps. Also, by the way, people are dying upon deportation. Of course. Yeah. We've already, in my reporting, we've already. So people who would be alive have been deported to their deaths. Thank you for that. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, it's it's. I I also volunteer in detention centers. Mm. And where are you um, based? Orange County, California. Okay. I'm also in Newport Beach, which is the most conservative, you know, yep. place for this. And I, I will say from a positive perspective, uh, the organizations that have flourished since Trump's election are really doing good things. I wouldn't have been volunteering in the de detention center. And we also do immigration clinics for the undocumented so they can protect their children if they're deported, they're American-born children. Yeah. So anyway, positive things are happening. But one concern I have is a couple people I'm visiting are women who are seeking asylum for abuse and from, from their husbands or from gangs. And now Jeff Sessions has said that that doesn't count for asylum. And I have two people coming up for a hearing, which now I think they're going to be deported, and their children are here. And, and so I just, I'm wondering from a legal perspective, do you have any insight on that? And, and is that just, we can only change that by changing who's in office? And, and if it ends up going to the Supreme Court, who knows? Gotta just be, saying. Yeah, yeah I, I think you're right. And um, I, I'm so grateful for people um, like us and the people in this room that have been supporting the organizations like MALDEF, right, like the ACLU, um, and other local organizations that are doing this work that are fighting day in and day out. And maybe I wasn't paying attention before, but the number of cases that are being lawsuits and um, district uh, cases that are coming up, um, it's just, to, to me, dumbfounding, right, how, how we're having to fight this in the courts. Yep. But it's also very scary what is happening with our Supreme Court and the nominations, right? I don't know if you remember, but um, even during the Obama administration, he couldn't confirm any of his judges. And now they're confirming judges in every district, everywhere we go. So um, uh, I think it's scary, and I think that it's going to have to take a different level of work. Like, the legal work is, is going to be important, but we're really going to have to step it up to show, right, with our bodies that what is happening is wrong. Let me just say this, because so much of this is federal and what's happening in DC. It is so important that we understand that this is a local community thing, right? That's why, for example, like, you know, um, volunteering at a, a detention center, all the women's rights groups, like, we can only fight what we can fight at the national level in DC. I think a lot of this is gonna be fought in your own communities and how you define who you welcome in your communities. For example, when these two women probably are gonna get deported, right? So who's gonna take care of those kids? I, you know, and like what kind of community effort is gonna to take to do that? I just think this is where communities have to really stand up and understand what the roles, what faith groups roles are. I think we haven't talked about that yet. You know. I, I'm, I'm atheist myself, but I feel very strongly that at a time like this, you know, faith communities of all backgrounds um, play an incredible role and fill an incredible gap. I mean, Western North Carolina, I heard about families that independently were taking kids to school because the parents were too afraid to drive them or buying people groceries because they were too afraid. So, you know, The Zookeeper's Wife, that movie, I couldn't even watch it because it's like, it's happening right now. Ma Maria, can There's we There's an underground, the, yes, lady. Can we take, because I mean, the, the time is going. Right. Do you mind if we just stay and you all, you all can just approach us? Oh, okay. Like in, on the room? Let, let's do that. Let's do a wrap. Not that many, yeah. Let's do yeah, it. Oh. 
Hence well, I'm being overruled <laughs> as a moderator, but I'm going to say, okay, so, so you I get do, the last I, question. I do want to say thank you for allowing me to, to ask my question. Where, where are you? So, right. I'm, there he is. I'm right there here. He is, there he is. Uh, right there. in front of you. Hi, how are you? Oh. So, so, <laughs> so, so, so I do want to say this, right? So I think that the reason why we have not been able to solve immigration the right way is because messaging matters, and we yeah. have messaged this uh, this issue the wrong way, right? So yes. our country is based off of a melting pot, right? So this assimilation of ethnicities and cultures and nationalities. And next week we celebrate 242 years of independence of those people who have migrated to this country. So we have messaged this entire thing the wrong way. And I wish we would have, I wish I could have talked earlier when there were more people here, right? Because there's two things I think should drive this conversation. History, if we look back to see how we got here, even in Aspen, which is once called Oot yeah. City because of the indigenous people yep. that were here, that will help connect people with where we need to go. But outside of history, we need to have a conversation about finances and how many ideas or industries are not being started because we have not been inclusive of the people migrating to the country. So to the gentleman that walked out and I wish he was still here around, hey, my kids are not able to get where they need to in school, how many ideas have are untapped? Yep. The, the reality is the generations before us were asleep at the wheel and yep. I understand they were focused on prosperity but we cannot be able to compete as a country where we need to go if we don't focus on history and finances and change the, the conversation that all of us are immigrants. Most of us, none of us were here originally, and that's the beauty of America because we are a melting pot. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess you're going to have the last question right there. Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Silky Shaw. I'm the executive director of Detention Watch Network. I am oh my a God, scholar this year. Nice to and meet you. Nice to meet, nice to see y'all. And I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm so appreciative of everyone bringing up the issue of detention. I think you're absolutely right, Jose, like, and Gabby, and like, this is a, this is a fight at the federal level. We need to, we're, we have a campaign called Defund Hate, where we're calling yeah. on members of Congress to defund DHS, defund CBP and ICE. And I think everybody, you know, call your congressperson. That's how you do it. And then at the local level, we're really waging a campaign on fighting the expansion of detention. There was just a request for information for 15,000 beds for family detention. That's a response to family separations right now. And so I think fighting your community, they're calling on the Department of Defense to hold people on military bases. This is internment. This is what's happening. And so Building I encourage you to go to detentionwatchnetwork.org, work with PANA, work with all these wonderful organizations here. And, um, and yeah, there, there are avenues to work. I have some cards here. I'd love to connect with folks who want to do this work. Please check her out and support her work. You guys, um, thank you so much for staying. Those of you, you are going to have to wrap. We're just going to have to, um, we can yeah, stick we'll around for a little bit. Thank you so much for sticking around and recognize your own responsibility. And to my panel, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.